Hello. I'm Julie Burstein. I'm the host here of Spark Talks at the Met. And it is wonderful to be here again. And to be here, I don't think it's raining yet. Uh, last time we were here, it was a deluge. So it's lovely to be here on a less, less wet evening. Earlier this month, a piece of music composed for the 750th anniversary of the Cologne Cathedral was performed here at the Met beside a temple that is much, much older, the Temple of Dender. Arvo Pert's canon of repentance was received with great enthusiasm by a sold-out crowd and is the catalyst for tonight's conversation about music, architecture, and awe. Before I introduce tonight's guests, we get a little treat. We're going to get to hear a little bit of the concert that took place last Monday night. This is a concert that the New York Times called Mystical and Serene. So let's listen to a little bit of Arvo Pert. an abrupt ending, but it gives us a taste. I know it's like, oh, more. <laughs> we'll get a chance to hear a little bit more, but it does give us a glimmer of what that experience must have been like um, last week when the Estonian Philharmonic Chamber Choir performed that work by Arvo Pert. We'll listen to a little more later in the hour, and we're taking the music of Arvo Pert as our catalyst for an exploration of how the spaces in which music is performed can amplify music's emotional power. We have wonderful guests this evening, each of whom has a unique perspective on the conversation. The neuroscientist Robert Zatori has spent his career investigating how music engages our brains, and he's also trained as a church organist. Peter Boutineff is a jazz bass player and a theologian. He is one of the organizers of the Arvo Pert Project, which brought all of this wonderful music to New York over the past week. And he told me that he spent hours talking with the composer the first time they met, but he had never actually heard his music the first time. And architect Stephen Hall has designed beautiful buildings all over the world, Many of them are inspired by musical principles and sometimes by musical scores themselves. He teaches a class about the architectonics of music at Columbia University. And here is an image of a design for a house that was drawn directly from a score, and we'll hear him talk about that a little later. So please join me in welcoming Stephen Hull 
Peter Butineff and Robert Zatori to Spark Talks at the Met. Thank you. So gentlemen, I've organized our conversation tonight into four parts. Um, it's a little homage to the musical form, to musical movements. And I'd like to begin with the connection between our physical selves and the part of ourselves that responds to music and art. And Peter, this grows out of a conversation that I had with you um, just after the concerts took place here at the Met and at Carnegie Hall, I asked you, what, what was it like to be in the audience? And one of the things you said was that you could feel the audience, that it was a visceral response to the music. Can you tell us, we just had a little bit of that, um, a little taste of that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that feeling when you were listening to Arvo Pertz's music? Um. <laughs> it was such a broad audience was one thing. It was, uh, I think even the Times Review referred to it, how just the breadth of the audience, the different, um, it said orthodox clerics uh, rubbed shoulders with, uh, you know, hipsters and <laughs> whatever. Um, and so this whole audience, uh, nobody was there alone experiencing this, like this is my experience of this music. It was a genuinely communal event uh, among this broad constituency. And yeah, the audience was wrapped in that amazing space, uh, the Temple of Dendur, right next door here. Um, and I spoke of it to you, yeah, as a visceral kind of an experience. And then I thought, how does that jive with a uh, spiritual experience? Well, I think in, in, in human existence, you can't separate the two somehow. The spiritual is experienced in a physical body, and it's experienced through sound in physical space. Um, and so that, that's something that you and I continue to talk about as well. Robert, when you think about, uh, you know, people often talk about having a visceral reaction to music. Mm -hmm. Is that something that actually is scientifically true? Well, when we discussed it and you, you used the word visceral, I said, yes, that's literally the case. It's in the viscera. You know, the vagus nerve goes all the way from the brain down into the gut. And uh, there are physiological responses to music that involve uh, basically all of your, your physiological systems. So if you're aroused by music, you will have changes to your respiration, to your heart rate, to the, the skin conductance, and so forth. And... Uh, those are quite literally visceral responses. And in relation to what you just said, I, I would agree with you that you know, this, the mind-body dualism doesn't really hold water uh, in the sense that we have these responses in our body, but um, they're coming from our mind via the brain. They're not, uh, it, your heart responds, but it responds because your brain is interpreting the sounds and causing that response. So, it's a back and forth, because once your heart is responding, then you're more aroused, so that's a different level of, of consciousness, if you will. Stephen, I know you were here at the concert last week. Um, what was it like to hear that piece of music in that space for well, that's you? very special, because the space, I think it has a reverberation of about 1.8 seconds. The space has got this resonant quality it also comes out of the stone walls and the size of it. But there was something else that was going on. I mean, there was not just the music and the space, but there was a sunset taking place mm -hmm. that, that was all timed because it started at 7 and the sun kept getting weaker down on those limestone facades. And the sun set right when the piece ended. <laughs> so there was this kind of strange... And the other thing, there were these birds flying in the park. Mm. And, you know, that's like a very rare thing to see, Yes. you know, in New York, you're sitting in a concert and you're watching birds fly in the park. I th there was a lot of things that were going on. And it's rare to just <laughs> sit for an hour no, in New York. No, but it didn't seem like an hour. But it wasn't because you were hearing it that music. It seemed like five minutes. One of the things that you said to me when we were talking about this event was, and you said it just before, was that music is something that we enter like a space. Right. 
Music surrounds you. It's an immersive experience. And the, the, my class I, t I started off with, you know, sculpture you can turn away from. Uh, painting you can turn away from. But music surrounds you and architecture space surrounds you. And that's one of the reasons I was, have always been interested in Pert's music because he, you know, he sees sound as space. And I talked to him a little bit about it. And uh, that's very interesting to me. There, you know, there's, and I tell my students, you know, music has no exterior. You know, you see architects today just making these images and putting them up on the, on the websites, just these objects, rather hideous, some of them. <laughs> and uh, especially with the computer, they're so able, so facile to make these objects. When I tell my students, I said, look, the, uh, we're, we're working on the connection of the architectonics of music, and music has no exterior. It's an in, it's a space within, and that's what architecture, that's the power of architecture, I, I feel. Peter, when, when Stephen talks about music as space, and, and Robert too, as musicians, does that, how does that resonate for you? Well, I, I can answer more as a scientist than as a musician. Okay. And um, uh, there's a, a slide there that if you want to put it up, you could, um, the one with the brain with some big arrows on it. Let me find it. And, and the point is that um, the way the brain handles, I mean, sound evolves over time, and music is, is it this yes, one. Yes, this one. So um, music is a, is a temporal unfolding of sonic events. But when you look at the brain, those upper arrows there represent how sounds, which are in these colored regions of the cortex, get transported into a part of the brain called the parietal lobe. Parietal, by the way, means wall in Latin. So means wall, so yes. we're talking about space yes. even in the brain. But it's the part of the brain that handles space. Literally, as you're navigating through a building, it's your parietal lobe that is computing the relationships of the walls and the spaces and so on. It also turns out from our research that uh, when you're perceiving patterns of sound as they evolve in time, it's that same pathway. Mm. So there's actually a sort of literal overlapping of the processing of um, events in time in the context of music and the processing of visual spatial information. Fascinating. <laughs> what was going through my mind when Stephen was talking was um, specifically about Peretz music as space. Uh, when you enter into an, a space, you're interacting with it in some way and, and you're, you're doing other things within the space and you're somehow affected by that space. Uh, Peretz music, more than so much contemporary music, uh, lends itself to other activities in the sense that, or at least it has lent itself, which is why it's so popular as um, movie soundtracks uh, or as kind of background to something else happening. Uh, the composer himself isn't necessarily very happy about that, that his music is sort of, you know, <laughs> a backdrop for something. But somehow um, film directors and others have, have seen his music as something that, uh, uh, that gives, gives place to uh, either a story or an image, you know, or another, basically, another experience, another activity. And so, you know, Peretz uh, Spiegel im Spiegel has been used in countless uh, movies and in, you know, movie trailers and, and in YouTube videos and everything. Um, and so have some of his other pieces. And so it kind of functions almost as a, as a space that you can enter in and then do your Put tell your, your story, story mm -hmm. inside of it. Stephen, I wanted to turn to you and talk a little bit about your own work taking scores and using them as an inspiration for um, the design of space. I know you have a recent house in Korea that you designed with a particular score in mind. Right, but I think more, a better example is the, the, the first house I did oh, based okay. on Bela Bartok. Great, let's, let's talk There's about three that images. then. There was a piece called Music for Strings, Percussion, and Celeste. Oh, that's written in 1936. Yes. That's my favorite and piece in the whole world. It's a great world. piece. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was teaching and I had a musical <coughs> student uh, uh, from the Juilliard School, John Sito, and I asked him, I said, I went to the site and there were these dams. The water was going a little bit over, just tiny little dams. And I asked him, you know, is there something in music that 
that has the basis of overlap. And he said, yeah, well, stretto. And I said, well, what's a good example? And he gave me right. that piece. Right. But there's a lot of stretto. Yes. Can you find yes. the image? You know what? I'm going to show you, and then you can find it for me. Um, so stretto the, has, let's see. It was the first, it was on the first. There we go. It was the first. The first? Yeah, there it is. OK, great. There it is right there. Oops, I'll put that up. Great, thank so you. So it was really, it made this design so easy in a sense because the client was like a client from heaven that said, we just want a house for our art collection mm. and a place to sleep, and we don't want any guest room. Put the guest room somewhere like a guest house because I don't like to face people at the breakfast <laughs> First thing table. in the morning. <laughs> And otherwise, we want you to do this. And uh, so I could work on this problem as a you know, u unique exercise. And you could see the musical score, and, and, and it has four movements. The interesting thing is, and I, I, I always say that uh, music has a tectonic materiality. Mm. So does architecture, of course. Mm. And I'm very interested that architecture, that language of structure, light, and the tectonics of the materials mean something. You know, not, it's not just a computer drawing. So I divided the house into four movements, and then in, in, the, in, the, in the piece, uh, Bartok had organized the strings on one side of the stage and the percussion yes. on the other. He divides yes. the heavy and the light. So I said, we'll divide the heavy and the light. Oh, so you can see the organization of the house is these four spatial dams, which are made out of concrete block, and this very lightweight tubular structure that you know, flows through them. And uh, is there another? There's another slide right after that. Let's and I, see. And I, I had this equation, you know, that, 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 that I felt that there was a kind of deep relation. That was my beginning, and, and then after that we did, we've done something like five projects based on different mm. pieces of music. So the, and it's the, just, the most recent one is the Korea House. It sounds like the idea, this idea of overlapping was something Stratos. that you were thinking about, and then your student said, here's a piece of music that does no, exactly... No, I, I didn't know much about Stretto. I mean, I rely on a lot of extra help. Like, I teach this class with the composer Raphael Mostel, mm. and Dimitri Zacrelia is, a, you know, a pianist who knows all these things, so I'm just a dumb architect, but I can use a lot of other people with good to friends. help me, <laughs> if I, you know, figure out how to make these connections. And if I remember correctly, in that piece, there's there's a theme that then gets retrograded. Yes, right? the retrograde row that yes. goes on in there. Right? So that retrograded, it and gets sort of turned upside down. It, it, it so that's from, how we did the guest from house. From front to back and from back to back. <laughs> that's exactly how we did the guest house. After we did the right. house, I said, what we'll do is we'll just do the retrograde row, and it was a flip. So in the guest house, and I don't have an image of it. Is there another image? Uh, no, it's One just those two, this? but we can go back to this, and you can describe you can Well, it's not here. It. It's not here. Yeah. But any, anyway, it's the, it's the flip. So the you know the, the the lightweight is you know it's inverted from this you right. know, this condition. And here. when we've actually literally done an experiment where we have people listen to a pattern of tones, and then we reverse it and ask right. them is it correctly reversed or not. Right. And when people are doing that, it's the parietal region of the brain that is active, which right. is that same region, which is involved in say rotating something visually. That's so so when you're you know, building your, your mental image of those uh, beautiful buildings and you're creating these representations that you're flipping around in space, you're actually using the same part of the brain exactly. that Bartok might have used in Task. creating those patterns which can be flipped around in right. time. Another reason I use Bartok is he composed using the golden section, you know. Mm. This joint to that joint to that joint is one point. 618 is the golden section. The Fibonacci series he used. Yes. And we use that in all of our buildings. 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55. Mm -hmm. You know, we use that. So that pattern. All, all of our buildings have that, that kind of a proportional adjustment later mm -hmm. in the project. So every one of our projects has that. But he composed music really mathematically based on the golden section. A number of things, actually. So that's why Bartok was interesting as well. Mm -hmm. And math seems to be an underpinning of both music and architecture. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Robert, I find this very interesting that the same part of the brain is used for imagining visual things and for imagining musical mm -hmm. things. Is that usual that there's a part of the brain that works with both our visual system and our auditory? Well, it's, it's because um, what that part of the brain is doing is basically a computation. And the computation is very abstract, very high level. 
So it can perform that operation on any different number of inputs. It can also do it based on linguistic inputs, for instance, when you, when you use syntax in, in speech. Some of that same mechanism is, is going on. So it's really the task that it's, that right. it's performing, so, you know, not the kind of sensory input. The brain is a very high level uh, problem solving machine, mm -hmm. right? And uh, once in, in evolutionary terms, what's remarkable is that once you've solved a problem of one type, What's fantastic is that you can then apply that solution to other kinds of problems, mm. right? So it's very likely that, based on, on uh, you know comparative studies in other species, it's very likely that the reason we even have this bit of brain is to do things like reach out and grasp an object, because that's incredibly important if you're you know an arboreal uh, primate trying to you know grab onto uh, branches and so forth. But once you've figured out how to do that you can then apply the same solution to sounds. And so, you know, it may be that one of the reasons we have music is because our ancient ancestors were climbing around in trees. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> is music a human drive? Is it something that goes back that far, do you think? Well, we know that um, music seems to be have been around as long as humans have been around. and. Um, you may look for that slide of uh, uh, archaeological finds relating to oh, yes. ancient flutes. So um, archaeologists have discovered flutes made out of bones of different uh, animals. And the, uh, the oldest of these comes from the Danube River Valley, and it's about 40,000 years ago, which means that um, it's about the same uh, time as the... Uh, cave paintings uh, in uh, Lescaux or Altamira. And what's really remarkable here is that 40,000 years ago, our human ancestors, you know, they didn't have a lot of technology to survive, and yet they spent time and effort and technological um, skill to create these instruments, showing you, A, how important it was, and B, it means that music must have already been around for much longer be before that, because you can't just build a flute if you don't have a musical system already in place, right? Um, if you actually compute the distances between the holes uh, for the fingers, it corresponds to a diatonic scale, which is pretty amazing. And mm. coming back to Arvo Perret, uh, one of the things that, that he emphasizes is going back to you know music of medieval times, um, but he's actually going back even much, yes. much longer ago mm -hmm. than that, because mm -hmm. it's, uh, the diatonic scale is something that's, that's essentially been around as long, probably, as humans have been around. Peter, do you have uh, something to say about the diatonic scale and Peart's music? Um, <laughs> there's a couple of pieces of, of Peart's that are slavishly obedient to the diatonic scale. Um, one of them was heard the other week in Carnegie Hall, Cantus in Memory of Benjamin Britten, which consists of uh, a descending minor scale uh, performed uh, in five different tempos. Uh, it's a proportional canon, but it consists entirely of simply a descending scale. Da, 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 da. There's another piece that's much earlier called Solfeggio, which consists entirely in an ascending major scale uh, that is just, it's just sung note by note in, in different registers, but it's, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And it exposes, in both of these pieces, uh, they are, not that he was attempting to make a statement, I don't think, but effectively they show that within this basic and, as you're saying, primal scale, there are all these latent potentialities for, for harmony and for dissonance. And so even this, this simplest of simple pieces, Solfeggio, I think it's from the 1960s, uh, all it is is an ascending major key scale, but it, it contains these minor ninths and minor seconds and these amazing intervals just because it plays with registers. And so it's simultaneously very, very primal, mm -hmm. but also, uh, what would, you could say, 
modern and dissonant mm -hmm. and challenging at the same time. Has Pert ever used uh, pentatonic scales? Because that's, that's the other very ancient musical scale, which is... Bela Bartok used a lot of it. Yes, right. yes. he certainly right. did. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's I what can't these remember other his are, uh, use of a pentatonic scale, but of course the, the triad is this fundamental melodic building block of his Tintinavoli mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so with a triad, you're, you're on your way to a pentatonic scale, I guess. Three out of the five, I guess. Three Stephen, out of the five I, bad, right? I, I know you're thinking <laughs> about focusing on Arvo Pert for your architectonics of music. Right. When you think about a composer, what is it that you dig into that you and your students... Well, I've been researching like days for this panel, so... <laughs> and now I can ask you, because I'm trying to understand Tin tenabuli. I know it's from the Latin, it means little bells, and it's mathematically exact connection of one line to another, a rule where the melody and the accompaniment are one. And he said, one plus one, it is one. It is not two. So I'm using this one plus one equals one as a project right now. We're doing a project with two interns called Explorations of In. Hmm. And that's going to be one of our platforms to get into this, this, let's say, experiment, trying to find a, the equivalent in architectonic space to what this, I mean, you, you were talking about pieces that he did before he took eight years off to f right. discover this method mm -hmm. of Tintinabuli. So there was eight years he worked in silence and then came back with this, this invention, basically, mm -hmm. which is, I think, the, the key to what we're, you know, the Tadeum is that, uh, uh, I think the first piece that it was in 1976. Alina. Uh, right, mm -hmm. which I, I've got, been listening to for a long time. But I, I was always trying to understand, what is it in this music that's so different? And I think it's that. I think it's that one plus one equals one. Yeah. And I'm trying to find you know, a parallel in architecture. And I think Olivier Messiaen had similar tendencies. He did something, I, I, yeah, he did something called uh, a non-retrogradable rhythms in which the sequence and time value remains the same whether you read left to right or right to left. That's similar to walking through architectural space. Oh. If, we could, if, I, if we could figure that out, it would be something pretty amazing. So, so like we're, if we come back in a year, you may have some more. Well, it might take longer than that. It might take eight years. <laughs> it might take eight years, right, <laughs> right. So Peter, I saw you nodding your head with this one plus one equal one. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've heard talk about? No, I'm just always nodding. It's an absolute perennial theme and what you were referring to, Stephen, uh, Tintinaboli. So you're talking about this eight-year silence or near silence where he, uh, it's not as if he's, he's fasting like I will now not compose. Uh, it's that he kind of ran aground and, and uh, a creative and, and spiritual and political crisis, everything happening at once. At the same time, he's also uh, finding his way into the Orthodox Church, which, as we know, has a profound influence on his whole compositional odyssey after the early 70s. Now, during this silence, one of the things he's doing is he's filling notebooks with melodies, monophonic, just melodies. Uh, and part of what you realize when you look at these notebooks is that he's, he's a genius in just the construction of melody. But he does some things that, uh, that even like John Cage used to do. He, he kind of, without even thinking about how a melody would sound, he'll think about how it looks. You know, he'll, he'll pattern a melody in the shape of a flying bird, you mm -hmm. know, for example, mm -hmm. and just see how that sounds. And he's writing these melody, 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 uh, obsessively almost. And then uh, he speaks about... Uh, and he tells, he tells you, he, I can name the, the day and the time this happened where I uh, discovered the second voice. And that's the triad voice. The triad being kind of the building block of that scale we're talking about. Uh, the triad voice, you know, la, 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 would be a minor triad, or ma, la, la, would be a major triad. So that's, that voice now for him becomes inextricably intertwined with the melody voice. And the piece, Alina, which you mentioned, is probably the perfect example of how you have these two, they're, they're simply, you can, play it, you can play it with like two fingers, probably. 
Uh, it wouldn't sound great, better if you do it that way, but uh, there's, they're, they're always, the notes are always sounded together. You have a melody voice and you have a triad voice, and there's a rule even as to how they interact. He, he writes according to rules and formulas. But when he plays one note, one of these parts by itself, it doesn't sound particularly special. It's when they come together that you realize that one plus one equals one in the sense that you're not even necessarily hearing harmonies and dissonances. You're hearing kind of one note event at any moment. And so it is that the, that the melody voice and the triad voice complete each other. He said, when I, when I discovered that, that triad voice, it was like thunder coming out of a, a blue sky. And then suddenly, it's almost like he heard a voice saying, without me, you can do nothing, which is, of course, the voice of, of God in the scriptures as well. And so it's without that triad, the melody is simply something floating aimlessly, and it's the triad which grounds it and brings it, brings it back somehow. And so one plus one equals one. Neither voice exists alone. We've moved into the second movement of our conversation, which is this idea of voice. And it's been fascinating to hear the two of you talk about this idea of two voices becoming one and thinking about it visually. And Robert, I wanted to ask you about voice and space and what we might know about the way yeah. we used our voices. Well, it's interesting you say two voices becomes one because um, I sort of alluded to the idea that if you've created an, an instrument, you have the technology to create an instrument that only makes sense if you have a musical system already in place. Where could that musical system have come from? Clearly, it could only come from the human voice because we have a vocal tract and you know other animals have vocal tracts as well, but we control ours much better. Actually, we have direct control from our motor cortex down to the larynx, which other species don't. Mm. Um, That's different. We have a different kind of control of our larynx than yeah, other yeah. species. Yeah, we can modulate mm. uh, the vocal musculature to an extent which is impossible for any, uh, any other creature, mm. which is why we can sing. But two voices becoming one makes me think of the following idea, which is that if you have more than one person and you're doing something like reciting a repetitive text or set of words as you would in any kind of ritualistic prayer. What's going to happen if they're both people are doing this simultaneously? Two things have to happen. First of all, they're going to synchronize in time because otherwise you're not going to understand what's being said. And secondly, you're going to adjust your pitch because otherwise it'll be dissonant. So two voices will become one. And yeah. it seems to me that the important role of music in all kinds of rituals, not only religious ones, but certainly importantly in religious ones, uh, must have some kind of ancient origin in this phenomenon where as soon as you have a group of people who are trying to say something together, they're going to become aligned in time and in pitch. And so that's probably the origin of something like chant, is many voices becoming one. And when you do that, there's also um, a kind of a, a natural um, resonance, if I can use that word, with the other people, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've aligned your movements, you've aligned your, your speech with everyone else, you feel part of a whole. You're not just one person anymore, you're a member of a larger group. And it gets back to what we were talking about at the beginning too, which is this idea of our bodies and our minds that to create music, we have to use our bodies, we have to move. Another thing that um, I was thinking about as you were talking about those first chants is the spaces in which we might have sung. So I think about that and think about what the resonance in a cave might have been like. Well, exactly, right. So if you're, if you're carrying out this uh, you know, multi-voiced uh, activity and you happen to be in some kind of cave, it's going to resonate, right? Um, and so that's going to amplify the sound, which makes it more powerful, but also it will resonate in particular ways. And I'm sure as an architect, um, you would uh, understand exactly what this is about, right? Because it'll be, depending on the size of the structure, right. 
the wavelength that fits within the, that and space. And if there are curves, they will the, be the focal amplified. point have to be mm. adjusted. That's that chapel in, the, in that chapel. So were, the chapel you, of Saint Ignatius is. Let's a take example. a look at that. And I know Stephen, you've created. It will take me a moment to get there. So let me ask you about it. You've created work both for people to live in, so that's a different kind of mm -hmm. acoustic experience, and then also for performance. Right. Um, when you're thinking about a space like a chapel where people will sing, what, um, what well, are this, you thinking about? The, the Chapel of St. Ignatius, which is in my hometown, uh, was a competition, but a lot of architects wanted that job. Even Philip Johnson went after that job. And uh, I, I, gave a, I gave a lecture. You know, I'm not Catholic. I'm not, I'm not Jesuit. I'm not, I said, I admitted, I'm not Catholic. I'm not Jesuit. I, maybe I'm pagan, but I believe in the religiosity of space. Here we go. And I, when I gave my lecture, they, the Jesuits are a very, very intelligent group of people, and they got it 100%. I was talking about tactility. I was talking about the haptic realm, the materiality. And... They, and so, and it's, it, the, the concept is seven bottles of light in a stone box. If you go to that watercolor drawing, which is the first drawing, mm -hmm. seven bottles of light in a stone box, and they, they were totally supportive of that. And, the, mm. you know, it's a concept that each one represents one of the pieces of the program, like the, you know, the narthex, and, the, and, the, and so you have the Blessed Sacrament, the choir, the altar, you know, the, the, the oh. daily procession. So... <laughs> it's funny because I always reveal my concept to the client. Then the, the campus architect in their office said, oh, we've got to shrink this. Let's take three or four of these bottles out. And the campus ministry said, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> there are seven days, there shall be seven bottles. We're staying mm -hmm. with Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then what happened was they hired an acu acoustician. Go to, the, go to the drawing of the, of the section. We won't, this is a, a, another idea, oh, which here is... here we go, this one. Right. So they, they hired an acoustician who said, you know, you know I, I'm going to resign because you're doing something I can't, you know, they're going to sue me. <laughs> uh, you know, all these curves, you know. What, you know. Ah. I said, but their focal points are below the floor level, so we're not going to get those hot spots you get in curved space. Unless right? you I organized all these. Deep down. So I said, I'm taking the responsibility because I want to just plaster surfaces. Mm. not acoustic things. So they put in a $40,000 sound system that they never use. No. <laughs> because the because reverberation the... time is 1.9 seconds, which is just like wow. an old church in Europe. You know? And I, it's, it's all about these, these shapes and, and, and the acoustical hotspots. Yes, there are hotspots, but I put them below the floor. If you make these curves wrong, you put a hotspot there, you get a terrible mm -hmm. focusing... Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm working right, on this right, other right. curved project, which yeah. I'm really worried about. So. <laughs> and wasn't the piece of uh, Pertz that was performed here originally composed for the Cologne Cathedral? Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. the one that was performed at the, which the Temple of Which also has an incredibly long reverb time, right? Mm. As an organist, I always look mm -hmm. for it's places like, like seconds, that. because two and a half seconds there, I two think. Two and a half seconds. Two and a half. Wow. Yeah. That's, you can almost talk to yourself. That's a, that it's almost on the verge of getting in the way of the music, actually. Right. You know. it, it hides mistakes, I can tell you, which is a really <laughs> a good thing if you're an organist. And Stephen, is, is this idea of reverb time something you think about even when you're creating a resonance? Of or course. It's everywhere. Resonance is everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, the, acoustic, the acoustics are, you feel them in your, in your, in your body. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, yeah. you can, you well, can and let's not forget, going back to the voice, that um, the reason we have singing and speech is that we have resonances in our head, mm. right? right. The, the, the vocal apparatus and the, the pharynx and, and so on uh, literally are resonators. So right, which is... If, if all you have is the, the vocal cords that are vibrating, you wouldn't be able to hear anything because it would not produce enough volume. So and, our, and our bodies would, are resonance right. spaces. And, and, and that's why we need silence. Desperately, mm. that's. I think humanity needs silence. That's why I have a re weekend house in Rhinebeck, and I go there, and it's dead silent. Maybe you hear some birds. By the way, those bird songs, they can really do their vocal cords, <laughs> right? There's they Messiaen, have, <laughs> right? Yeah, Messiaen. Right. He based his music on right. bird songs. Right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can't. Yes. You can't hear that in the city. You can, you can't hear that yeah. in the city. They have a they have a different 
apparatus than we, we right. do. They have a right. syrinx instead and of a larynx. And I think that's one of, the, one of the pollutions that we have to face today, which is sound pollution mm -hmm. it, it, everywhere. And they're, pumping no, and they're pumping more sound in to cover up the sound that's already disturbing us. So you go and they get the Muzak, you know, background sound, pumping that in. It's so, crazy. You so know, space it's like, it's like, like kind of torture, you know. So spaces like this are a place where you can go to oh, yeah, listen to music or listen to silence. Right. right. It's sitting in there in silence. It's great because of the light. There's all these different kinds of light. That with with the, the various windows the, that you Each put bottle in is the... a different kind of light. Mm. There are the spiritual exercises, if you want to go to that slide. Yes. The, the Jesuits go for these four-week retreats. You probably know all about this. You know more about it than I do. And there's, there's a spiritual exercise. You say something and they say something back to you. I'm not a Jesuit either, so. <laughs> <laughs> There's a color, watercolor drawing. A watercolor, so, okay. So okay. what I did was, uh, each bottle, next one, each next bottle one. has two colors. You know, if you look at a blue rectangle and you stare at a white sheet of paper, you see a yellow rectangle. So I, I made each bottle a complementary color. So if there's a red rectangle, there's a green field of reflected color. Mm -hmm. If there's a blue rectangle, there's a yellow field. So it's just like their spiritual exercises, the complementary colors. Fantastic. Now go to the next slide. You see, that's right. There's a purple field and an orange. And then the next one is, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a red lens and a green field. This is all back painted green. And there's another piece of glass. So what happens in Seattle, you know, the sun doesn't come out that often. But when it comes out, <laughs> it's exciting. A cloud can pass in front of it uh. and then go away. So these pulse with the Seattle light. So uh. there's this movement of the clouds, and you can if you sit in there and it's a cloudy day and the clouds are moving across the sun, these things pulse. Mm. You know, so it's a really great place to spend a few hours and just, you know, relax and think. This brings us to our third movement, which is um, shape and pattern and space, I think, too. So that's something, as I was thinking about this conversation and thinking about the three of you, mathematics underpin it, but there's something deeper, I think, in terms of pattern and shape and space. Um, and Robert, I know you've written about how our expectations of what a pattern, a musical pattern might bring us are part of our appreciation of music. Can you tell us a little bit about that. Right, well, you know, the idea of pattern is, is central to all of our cognition because we perceive patterns in, in everything. And this goes back to the idea that the, that the brain is a, a problem-solving machine. It, it is attempting to detect regularities when they exist, right? So as we listen to music, we're always listening in terms of um, regularities that we know to exist from our entire listening experience. So you can't listen to music without the knowledge that you bring to that experience based upon your own particular history, right? Which is why it's sometimes difficult to uh, understand music from cultures that are different from the ones that we already know because we don't have that history. So it's what um, psychologists call statistical learning. So by being exposed to music throughout our lives, we have some kind of implicit understanding of what are the regularities that we can expect. So if we hear a one chord and then a four chord and then a five chord, we know that it's very likely, statistically, that another one chord will follow. But it could be a six chord, in which case it's a deceptive cadence, for instance. And our brain is constantly computing these relationships. Um, and I think that is true for music and it's true for other kinds of experiences that we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, musicians, of course, are deeply knowledgeable about this. And what I think um, music such as uh, uh, Arvo Peretz or, or other uh, successful composers, what they do is it's neither uh, too predictable, because otherwise it becomes boring, nor is it completely unpredictable, because that's also actually boring. There's a sweet spot where you are led to expect something, but then what you get is actually better than what you expected. Mm -hmm. Nice. And that's, mm -hmm. that's literally rewarding, as in it, mm -hmm. it activates the reward centers of our brain because our brain is doing these computations all the time, um, predicting what should happen. And then if what you predicted 
is x, and what you get is actually even better, well, that's uh, an element of surprise, which is very positively reinforcing. That's so interesting that it, we don't want what we expect, we want something even better than what we expect, mm -hmm. that that is even more rewarding than the resolution we were, we were thinking of. Yeah, yeah, and, and there are actually um, mathem mathematical models of uh, neurons in the brain that carry out this computation. It's called the reward prediction error. So, you know, if uh, you go to, uh, you know, if I pick up this cup and I expect that there's water, and I get water, well, that's fine. Um, but if I get a fine Bordeaux instead, uh, that would be a terrific surprise, right? <laughs> so. We, we don't usually serve Bordeaux with the Met, but maybe, maybe one day. Um, Peter, as you think about the music of Ervo Pert, this idea of resolving in a way that surprises us, is that something that um, you think his music does? Uh, yeah, very much. I, I, one thing that's commonly observed about his music is that it sounds at the same time uh, ancient, primal, or at least medieval, uh, but also extremely modern. And I think it, the, the modernity is where you discover these uh, surprising and gratifying resolutions. Uh, but it is also, uh, although, although people experience this music as very free and freeing music. Uh, it's not an unfamiliar irony to say that sometimes the most freeing uh, works of art or, or, or stories are, are the ones that are very, very carefully structured. And so Per writes uh, in accordance with rules that he sets himself. And it, he says once, once he's kind of established the rules of a piece, uh, the composing of the piece is just almost happens by itself. It's, it's a concept that drives the design. That's what we do Precisely. in architecture. The same right. thing. Mm. A concept, an idea drives the design. Right. It's the same, there, there's a similarity there that I, I, you know, I always felt that, but now I really realize it. Uh -huh. right. To some <laughs> extent, it, it could be called mathematical and structural. But here's where it would tie into your previous theme of a word or a voice, because what generates Peart's music is almost always text. It's word. Even his pieces that are not composed to explicit texts that are vocalized are very often composed along the pattern of, of a text. Uh, and in l probably literally 99% of cases, it is a sacred text, because this is what means the most to him. Uh, and so here we can kind of introduce another theme that is kind of an unavoidable theme within Peret's music is uh, whatever we want to, however we want to define spirituality, uh, I think everybody here would have a different kind of definition, a different entry point into that whole world of spirituality. But with Peart, it's right in your face because it's these texts that are either taken from the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament or from prayer or from liturgy of the Christian church. And that's what's there. And somehow that manages to find itself under uh, the radar <laughs> in the sense that I think uh, many of us moderns have a kind of a uh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Uh, oh, and especially kind of in the West, there's kind of a backlash against traditional Christianity. So here's this, here's this comp composer who, you know, you can't, you know, you listen to the music, you, you read the liner notes, and then you read what's actually being sung. Well, it's right in your face. It's, it's, it's scripture. It, you know, the canon that was performed here is hour and 20 minute with this, yeah, hour and 20 minute long piece performed in the Temple of Dendur is the canon of repentance to Jesus Christ. I mean, it's like very, very explicitly s spiritual in its, in its content. And so this is what gives him his structure as well. It is those words. He, he said that, that his, his music is but clothing of words. That's all it is. It's, it's, it's a servant of the text of the word. And so I, I, I think you can't, you can't get out of, you can't avoid that fact when you come to his 
what drives his music and what gives it its structure. Is it, it's that text. It's interesting, Stephen, as, as Peter was talking and you said that this idea of concept, which could be text or could be a mathematical or could be, as you said, finding those voices, that that's so true for you as right. an architect, too. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, this that? house that I did in Korea, the Dayang uh, Gowrie and House, that. I was working and I was trying to make something Korean. I must have done 30 different designs and I had a crisis. Another great client from heaven. All he wants is a place to show his art. It's a guest house for his shipping company. And people <laughs> can stay there, and he wants to have concerts there and have <laughs> readings and show his art. And I can do anything I want. Okay? Is that a That's good really, thing to get? No, it's great. But, yeah, you know, yeah. what do you do? I mean, I saw I was going to try to be Korean, and I was doing ceramic things, and I had a crisis, so many. And it went on. And then we had, like, one month before I was going to go to... Korea and present this project, and I went into my office, and I grabbed John Cage's notations from 1959 or whatever it was, and I opened it up to this score by Ispan Anhalt, written in 1967. Here, I've got a picture. That was never played. Ispan Anhalt wrote this piece of music called Symphony of Modules, but it was never played because there were 200 musicians or some reason. <laughs> so I took it and turned it into light. There are 55 skylights, so, and I took the actual geometry of the score. So this is like a, an idea to drive the design. Relentless, okay? Three pavilions will just have the, the same height, and they'll, just, and they'll come up from a sheet of water, just push up, and the gallery will be below, connected. Everything that I need, the big space, is all underneath the sheet of water. And these three pieces of score, so that the gallery and all the music places wow. are underneath. And, and, and so this... And he, it was a great client, you know, I mean, just let, let me do every single detail and every part of this building is, but it's based on this relentless, just do this and carry it out, just like Parrot does with his, you know, the, with his geometry. Mm -hmm. And what was really the most fantastic thing was, it went on the internet and it kind of went all over the place and we got this letter from, he died, I tried to contact him, he lives in Canada, and he was 93 and he died. And, so I got a letter. Dear Mr. Hall, a few days ago, I googled my late husband's name, Isvan Anhalt, and found an entry, Isvan Anhalt Sym Symphony of Modules. This surprised me greatly, as this work was never been played before. <laughs> when I clicked on it, I discovered your name. In fact, you were inspired by the Diane, you know, to the project. Anyway, you know, he died, and she says, I have been very pleased to find a fragment of his music was transformed into another art form. Great. But then she... <laughs> she comes with another letter. A week later, she said, Mr. Hall would be interested in this. Describing a visit in England in 1965 to Salisbury Cathedral, he said, he wrote, you know, I took home with me an unexplained inspiration from these cathedral towns, especially Salisbury, which seems to have a close bearing on my new work. The immense expanses of gray stone and structural lines, so unfussy, and severe. And she said, this, this, he wrote this while he was working on Symphony of Modules. Mm. Wow. So the architecture inspired the Symphony of Modules. It was never played, and then we built it. Hmm. So, yeah. you know, it's a very interesting, that's like going kind closing, of back and absolutely. forth. Closing the circle. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this leads beautifully to, I think, to our last movement of our conversation tonight. And Peter, you, you touched on it when you talked about the spirituality of Arvo Peart's music. And I think just hearing the response to this piece of architecture that we're not even in, but we can see, it's that sense that music, art, architecture can evoke awe in us. And Robert, I wanted to, to ask you about that because that seems to be such a very powerful human emotion. And we're so lucky that we have artists who can evoke that in us. Well, indeed, it's, um, uh, I think it's something that all, all humans share is this wonder, um, the sense that we sometimes have when we're confronted with, with beauty. And um, of course, as a neuroscientist, I always put it back into, in terms of, you know, why does the brain even have this, right? Um, and I think it has to do with this idea 
of discovery, right? We're um, as as a species, we're we're very much uh, an exploratory species, right? We're always looking for new things, and it's related to this idea of looking for patterns, right? So um, when we look at this beautiful image, we're recognizing some of these patterns that are there, and um, uh, I think what uh, what Peter said earlier about rules being important um, is also part of this, right? It's the pleasure in discovery of what the underlying rules are. We're basically faced with a world that early in our development we just don't understand. And as we achieve understanding, whether we achieve that understanding via art or via science or via theology, there's a pleasure in, in that discovery, right? Because we're able to pull things together. And we're built, our nervous system is built in order to do exactly that, to discover new things and to un thereby understand our world. So I think that's why we have art and that's why we have science. It's an effort uh, to achieve that, that kind of understanding like, that gives us the sense of awe or wonder. Peter, when you think of Arvo Pert's music and this sense of awe, I mean, in terms of your own experience of his music, um, what, what comes to mind? Uh, perhaps what comes to mind is my first experience with his music. Uh, as you mentioned, when you introduced me, uh, I had the unusual fortune of, of meeting him and conversing with him for hours before I ever uh, even heard his music. And, you know, I got to ask him the question, you know, I hear you're a composer. What, what kind of music do you do? You know? <laughs> this Arvo Pert, you know? And he's like, well, you know, I, I sometimes do for choir, sometimes organ, sometimes orchestra. I'm like, oh, great, cool. Uh, this is like 1990, so he, he had already reached a, a considerable uh, degree of popularity. Uh, I was living in Oxford at the time in England, and, and I returned home, and as happens, you know, you hear a word or you meet somebody, and then like within days, suddenly that word is everywhere. And so, so suddenly I saw a sign, Arvo Pert, Passio is being performed in New College Chapel, New College, 12th century chapel. And, uh, you know, so um, this piece is, it's another, like the canon, it's, it's about a hundred minute piece. <laughs> and um, I, I think, well, enough about my experience, which you can imagine was uh, awestruck. I think one of the factors in, in a, a prolonged experience of awe is long form. And uh, both the canon that we heard the other week and then the pasio uh, are both these kind of pieces that you'd, you'd call kind of a slow burn. Mm -hmm. they, they, have this, uh, they have this cumulative force that, that is achieved, and in a way it's kind of earned, mm -hmm. so that by the end, each piece ends with a certain... Uh, dramatic climactic moment. In the case of Pasio, it's an explosive climactic moment. And uh, I would venture to say, subjectively, but that there is no other response to the ending of that piece than speechless awe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are all kinds of explanations for it, and I fully accept the purely n neurological one. Uh, but there again, I think that peace would not exist without the text, which is the passion of Jesus Christ, according to St. John, which ends with the crucifixion, uh, which is kind of perhaps, well, for Christians, it's the most awe-inspiring moment in human history. Not the resurrection. The crucifixion mm. is the most awe-inspiring moment in human history. So there's awe for you, mm -hmm. uh, interpreted through all these different ways. Yes, on many different levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stephen, I'm going to end with you. And I guess my question to you is twofold. One is, when have you experienced that feeling, both with music and architecture? And as an artist yourself, is it something that you think about to walk people through and towards, as, as Peter is talking about? Well, the history of architecture is full of these places that you can never get out of your mind. 
And I had the good fortune to be airlifted from kind of uh, Seattle or Washington with its shingled buildings and not, you know, there's some interesting places to Rome. And I lived right behind the Pantheon. Mm. And I went in there every day. It was so amazing. And I would see the light oh, coming light. in at a different yes. angle. And the rain, the days that it would rain, the, the little drops would be lit in different ways. And I never, I mean, I, I just, it was an, a place of awe. And I had to deal with the guards. He would let me in before the people. <laughs> every nice. morning. I would nice. he, I, he came a little bit early, so he let me in. And I went just like, you know, for a little while and then left. But every day, it was like a great, that was a great learning experience as a student. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's, the architecture has that power. It has the same power as music, I think. Mm. It Did you really ever try does. singing in there? <laughs> I have mm. heard, yeah. The acoustics, it's amazing. The acoustics are amazing, yeah. And I, I think, you know, we, you know, I, I, I feel like we get that in our buildings. People say that mm -hmm. if they... People that go in them, you have to go in them. My, my professor said, architecture is much more when you go in it than you, when you look at it. Uh -huh. Yes. So that was Hermann Punt, born in Berlin, mm -hmm. amazing professor. That, he's the one that got me to Rome. He said, you, should, you have to go. There was five students that were invited to apply, and I got out of Seattle, thank God. And then you brought Rome back with that well, cathedral and right. light that moved. After you live moves. in Europe for a year, yeah. if you're born in Seattle, you can, you're a changed person. You know, it's really different. It's hard to even think about. I mean, I still my father's 93 and lives in the first house I designed, so I'm wow. going back there for Father's Day. But yeah, I love it. You know, fish yeah. and mountains and all. But there's there's not a lot of awe-inspiring architecture, except for the chapel at St. Ignatius. <laughs> Where you see the light move when the clouds right. come across. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I want to end tonight with a quote from Albert Einstein that beautifully connects to things each of you have said. And Einstein wrote, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. It's wonderful to speak to three people whose eyes are wide open. Please join me in thanking Robert Satori, Peter Brittner, and Stephen Hall. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank my you, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight for another Spark Talk. There's going to be one more, two more actually, in December. So it's a long wait, but if you would like to come back, it would be lovely to see you again in December. Thanks so much. Mm. Thank you. Mm. 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 Mm.